<laughs> Yay. Wow. I thought usually when I log in, I turn it, you know, I pause it right away. Right. I didn't think it was running. It wasn't running. Okay, anyway. <laughs> so welcome. How are y'all doing tonight? Peachy. I'm glad to be here. Peachy. Why are you glad to be here? Because I love it here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad to be here too. Yeah. Yes. Yes. We're glad you're all of you. Well, yes. Yes. yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so does anybody have any thoughts on the message they want to start off with? I mean, I've got some things, but I'll let you all. Anybody online have any thoughts they'd like to jump in with? From the message, The Body of Christ, which was an awesome title for the message. It's awesome. Well, enough of a pause has gone by. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, pauses you know, don't bother me. It feels right? like the balloon inside. Yeah, right? is gonna <laughs> you know, yeah, but you're a teacher, so you just shouldn't bother me, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, I've known these things in my head for years, 11 years to be exact. <laughs> I've been hearing them for 11 years, but after the sermon on Sunday, something just really, really clicked. And I realized that I had spent most of my Christian life wooing God, trying to get God to be pleased with me, trying to get God to accept me. And after Sunday's sermon, God's just been telling me, that's what he's been doing to me. He's been trying to get me to accept him. Oh my goodness. Oh my gosh. It's it's like it just makes me quake in the core of my being. That God has been so concerned about what I thought about him. Hmm. And he's hurt that I haven't been able to trust him with all my heart. Mm -hmm. And so he's been doing everything he can to show me how good he is and how much he loves me. Mm -hmm so that I would accept him, which was exactly what I had spent my whole Christian walk trying to do, but in the opposite way. Right. So mm -hmm. it's just really had a profound effect on my heart. Wow. wow. That's a big thing. It is a real big thing. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. I think that's something, every time we get together, it becomes more and more clear. <laughs> Very similar thing is that it's not about us, it's about him. Mm -hmm. Right, and to keep thinking, we, and it's one of those things like we just need to keep hearing over and over again. Mm -hmm. It's not what I do; it's what He has done for us. And all of those man-made programs and systems and mm -hmm. thoughts and doctrines and details—all of those things of man are man-centered, man-focused with an attempt to do something to manipulate God one way or another, when in fact, all we need to do is just let him love us. Right. And that seems to be the hardest thing of all, <laughs> right? Because we get in our own way. Right, yeah. It sounds like God is cleansing his image in your heart mm -hmm. because yes. you were blind to his goodness. Yes. From last yes, week. Right. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Continued. Yes. Continued. Mm -hmm. That's the new heart. Exactly right. Yeah. Yes. The heart hey, uh, yes. I've got something to add if y'all can hear me. Yeah, we're good. Okay. I wanted to get this in before Greg gets on his roll. <laughs> once Greg gets going, man, he no, gets no, going. No roll tonight. <laughs> no roll. Okay. I had something click for me too. And it, it, it was a little thing that was a, that I realized is a, is a big thing. I don't know about you guys, but I got various translations of the Bible. I mean, I could, I could fill a whole bookshelf and that's not to, that's not even counting the access we have to the online versions of, you know, so many different translations. And I, it's like Greg's mom was saying, you know, I heard this, but it really didn't set in until until recently. Well, it was recently. Man, the best translation we use is Jesus Christ. And instead of getting all twisted on the Hebrew, the Greek, the Aramaic, the this, the that, the who said what, is just to use the translation of the person who was translated into the flesh. I mean, that's what Jesus is. He is the translated word. 
Yeah. He's mm-hmm. God in the flesh. And, and, and Greg, I'm going to throw this out because you might get tickled by this, but what really kind of triggered this is we're talking about how, uh, you know, if someone takes your coat, give them another one. And how you related to that, how, do, how as I heard it, how Jesus was stripped of his clothing, and yet he gave another coat by clothing us by, with the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. And that little thing made me think that everything in the Bible is about Jesus. <laughs> that you can really take anything that was sort of to be a command or a standard or uh, a or um, a, 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 a law as, as the carnal mind considers the term law, you know, a, a to do. It's not about that. It's actually reflective of the goodness of God, even down to the example of, you know, giving the coat, which is the clothing. And, and, and that's what Jesus did. It made me more excited about reading the Bible, which I've not done for a long time because I've got that default carnal translation in my mind and i just as i read the english words i'm reminded of that translation and i like i don't like that i don't i don't don't even want to think of those terms but now i have a different uh a different insight and that is is that the translation that i can go to to get the true meaning is jesus Yep. So if you don't see it in Jesus, then you're misunderstanding. And, and that, that to me is, is, again, it sounds like a little thing, but it's a huge thing for me and probably for everybody. But uh, yeah. so I just I wanted to throw that in there. Yeah, that, Thomas, that's what we talked about a lot on, um, on Monday morning in the group was the, um, was how to, let the word made flesh discern what scriptures are saying. And um, I don't remember this, the uh, verse that Maurice read out of Judges about Samson. I don't remember the specifics of it, but basically when you read it, I mean, you, if you just read it, it's, you know, Samson was saying, I'm going to die with the Philistines. But if you read it through Jesus as the filter, it becomes very clear that it's a, shadow of what he is going to do to save us from death mm-hmm. and it was like oh my gosh <laughs> yeah yeah um and we and, and greg offered up two or three other illustrations of you know verses that you think are one thing but when you look at them through the word made flesh they become very clear that it's talking about him and, and um what he has done to conquer fl- conquer death for us so um what you what you just shared is like yeah, I'm, I'm wrestling uh, with the exact same thing, and it's an awesome thing to wrestle with. I just want to make sure that you aren't saying or you're not thinking that God's hurt for himself oh, over no. you not accepting him. Hurting that I wasn't. Right. Yeah, he's, no, I he's hurting at the pain that's causing you. Right, yes. Right, that you don't see him, that you weren't seeing him in a light that would cause yes. you to accept them. Right. Right. That you weren't seeing them in a light where you, you were defenseless or vulnerable in his presence. Right. Yes. You were still guarded. Yes. He wouldn't be hurt for himself. He would be hurt at yeah. the pain that would cause you. Right. Okay. Yes. I just want to make sure that, that yeah. you understand that. Yeah. The, the body of Christ um, across the world and God bless us all. Right. <laughs> yes. We're all right. loved by God. And um when I say this, I say it from that premise, knowing that uh, there is nothing more valuable than than human beings. Uh, God Himself decided that human beings were were worth enough for Him to come and, and lay down His own life. So I say this with all that in mind. But the the body of Christ, the reason why it finds itself in so many so much trouble, like we talked about Monday, yeah. is there's a simple revelation in the Scriptures that. Jesus teaches in Matthew, and he, he teaches it throughout. Um, it was powerful because of who he was speaking to, being the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, who considered themselves to be masters right. of the law, right. right? You know, like in John, where he, he comes to Nicodemus, and he tells Nicodemus about, you must be born from above, mm-hmm. right? Unless your life is born from above, you shall not see the kingdom of God. 
right? And Nicodemus is like, what is it? Are you, are you a master of Israel and knoweth not these things? Yeah. Are you really calling yourself rabbi? You're a rabbi of the law and the prophets, and you don't understand the things that I speak of? Well, Jesus, like we talked about on Monday, and Jesus said, don't have many masters. Right. Call no person master, for you have one master, which means rabbi. Master does not mean like a person walking around in your house telling you what you need to do. It's not like a person in the house telling you you got to do the dishes or you need to cut the grass or you need to go to bed at this time or you need to go do to work, go to work. That's not what master means. Master in the Jewish mind, in the Jewish context, means rabbi. Oh. And so when Jesus says, don't call many men masters for you have one master, even the Christ, what he was saying is don't call anybody rabbi. You have one rabbi. Now, a rabbi isn't just like an oracle dude sitting up in a cave on a mountain that you go up there to get some wise saying from. When he uses the, the terminology master and rabbi, he's meaning specifically as it pertains to interpreting the law and the prophets, right? Yes. Because that's what a master of Israel was. A rabbi was someone that was thought to have the authority to interpret the verses, Okay, well, Jesus comes and says, there's actually only one person who has the authority to interpret the verses. I'm the only one with this thing called shmika, which is what they called it in the Jewish uh, religion. A guy had shmika, it meant he had the authority to interpret the law and the prophets. A scribe was just someone that could regurgitate what someone else said, right? Uh, uh, shmika is a guy with authority. So Jesus comes and says, I'm the only one with authority to interpret the law and the prophets. Now, we can just full stop right there because the reason there's 30,000 denominations in the earth is because everybody esteems their own self to be rabbi. Yes. Everybody esteems their own self to be able to interpret the law and the prophets. And the body of Christ has not come together and decided, by and large, that we don't really know what the law and the prophets say. Only Jesus knows. Jesus is rabbi. And what Jesus saw in the law and the prophets was made flesh in his death, in his burial, in his resurrection, and in his ascension. Yeah. Right? right? And you can see him describing pieces of it throughout his earthly ministry when he's teaching. Right? Mm -hmm. But we wouldn't have all these de denominations if everybody come together and said, I don't know what the law and the prophets teach. There's one person who has the authority to interpret the law and the prophets. His name is Jesus. And what did Jesus teach about what was in the law and the prophets? And you see this kind of thing when Jesus is on the Mount of Transfiguration, right? And the glory of God manifests in his body when he's standing up on the Mount of Transfiguration and Moses and Elijah are standing next to him. That's the law and the prophets yeah. standing next to him, right? And Peter's like, Lord, it's good that we could be here. Can we make a tabernacle for Moses and Elijah and a tabernacle for you, trying to put them on the same footing, right? And what is all of a sudden the voice from heaven say? This is my beloved son. Hear ye him. Right? right? And so Jesus is the interpretation of the word that's in the law and the prophets. He's the only interpretation. And we're not supposed to interpret it ourselves. We're supposed to submit all of our interpretations unto the word that was made flesh in Jesus. And we let what we see in Jesus interpret the law and the prophets for us. Okay? Yes. Right? Yes. That's how we're supposed to engage with the scriptures. Peter would come and say it this way. He said that the scriptures are not open for private interpretation. They're not open for private interpretation. Right. Listen, man, every single church has their own private interpretation. And the reason why they have their own private interpretation is because they've never seen what Thomas was just talking about, which is like what Peter says, we have a more sure word of prophecy. Jesus is the more sure word of prophecy. That's why John begins with, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word is God. Oh, and the word was made flesh. That's the word that's in the scriptures. That's the more sure word of prophecy we have. That's the word about God. That's the word about God's heart. That's the word that's in the law and the prophets. We were carnal, sold under sin, but the law and the prophets is spiritual. 
And so we couldn't see the spirit that was in there. So the spirit that was in there is the Lord Jesus. And the Lord Jesus put on flesh so that a carnal people could behold the spirit that was in the word always in the body of his death and his resurrection. And then we could start discerning the scriptures through the body of his death and his resurrection. And then that would start interpreting everything for us. Yeah. Right? Right. But you don't have that going on very much. But listen, the Holy Spirit is moving in the earth like he showed me when we first started the church. It's called restoring Christ as the head. Yeah. That's what it means for Christ to be restored as the head of the church. It's not in theory. Just because you claim the name of Jesus out of your mouth doesn't mean when you open up the scriptures, you're teaching the word made flesh. You could be teaching the carnal mind when you open up the right. scriptures, which is what all the Pharisees were doing, which is what Nicodemus was busy with, which is what most of the denominations in the body of Christ are busy with, teaching a private interpretation, teaching the carnal mind, and not teaching what was revealed in the word made flesh in Jesus. And so we'll just take one doctrine, right, to demonstrate this. And I think we did it in the, uh, the men's Bible study. Yeah. You could read in the scriptures, you could read in the law and the prophets, and you could think that there's a bunch of things we need to do for God in order to be blessed with life, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Like you could read that there and you could come out with that conclusion. Well, that would be a private interpretation. And you're not supposed to just read that there and say, well, that's what I see there, so that's what's there. You're not supposed to say that. You're supposed to have some humility and say there's one rabbi. That means if I think I see that in the law and the prophets, I'm now going to bring that to the word made flesh in Jesus and let that discern. So you think you're reading in the law and the prophets about all the offerings, all the things you got to do for God in order to inherit the blessing of life? Well, what did Jesus do when his hands were nailed to the cross to inherit the blessing of life? How many good things did Jesus do when it, there's a reason his hands were nailed to the tree? He's trying to make a point that, that you don't inherit the blessing of life by what you do for God right. or go why you do for yourself. Right. How did he inherit the blessing of life? Abba, right. into your hands I commit my desire for life. Oh, okay. Now that discerns my own thoughts about what I read in the Law and the Prophets. Right. And it tells me my own thoughts, they're not right. How do I know? Because I see in the Word made flesh in Jesus, the Word about how to inherit eternal life or the blessing of life is found in just committing your desire into the hands of the Father. It means for your heart to be persuaded that this guy has provided himself a lamb that he might clothe me in his life, yeah. the life of his lamb, right. like Thomas pointed out, right? Because you read, again, you read Matthew 5, <laughs> and you, you read in Matthew 5 about if someone steals your coat, go inside and grab your other cloak and come and give it to him. And you're busy reading that, thinking that it's talking about what you need to now do to inherit the kingdom of God. But Jesus is not teaching you about what you need to now do. He's teaching you about what the Father will do right? The father will turn the other cheek. The father will bless those who curse him. The father, if he's stripped naked, will go back into his house and get the, another cloak and give it to you. The, the father will pray for those who despitefully use him. How do we know? Because Jesus is God in the flesh. And we see Jesus turn the other cheek when they smacked him. We see Jesus pray for those who were despitefully using him when he was on the cross. We see Jesus blessing those who were cursing him when he was nailed to a tree. We see Jesus who was stripped naked, stripped naked on the cross, taking on our body of death, we see him ascend into the right hand of God in order to go and get us the cloak of his incorruptible life that we might be clothed upon in immortality, right? Amen. So you see the two different ways of reading the scriptures. Yeah. And the whole premise in the Sermon on the Mount is Jesus is drawing a contrast between the righteousness the Pharisees were looking to to inherit the blessing of life and God's righteousness towards humans to give it to them as a gift. That's what he's comparing, yeah. right? right? That's what he's talking about. Well, the Pharisees thought the power to inherit the kingdom of God was through their own ability to perform the works of the law, mm -hmm. through their own ability to gather life to themselves. Mm -hmm. That's where they thought the power to inherit the kingdom of God was. That's what they thought the word and the law and the prophets was. But Jesus comes as rabbi on the Sermon on the Mount. It says a law will go forth out of Jerusalem. A law will come forth out of Zion, and all the people shall be gathered unto God. Jesus was discerning the law on the Sermon on the Mount. And what did he say? Blessed are those who are poor in spirit. Right. You know who the poor in spirit are? Those who say that I can't give anything to you, God. 
The poor in spirit, do you know what the poor in spirit look like? Go read Luke 18, where you have the Pharisee standing before God, and you have the sinner standing before God. And the Pharisee is like, I thank God I'm not like this sinner who hasn't done anything for you. I've done X, Y, Z, and the other. And the sinner looks at God and says, Lord, I've got nothing to offer you. And what, is it, what did Jesus say? Which one do you think went away justified? Right. The one who said, I've got nothing in myself to offer you. Paul would even come and say on Mars Hill that God, you don't worship God by what you can do for him. God's not worshiped by the works of your own hands. God who has everything and needs nothing. He didn't come for you to give him something. He came to give you everything, right? And that's what Jesus is teaching. Blessed are those who realize they have nothing to offer God but themselves, and God has come to give them everything, right? right. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who, when they find themselves encompassed by sin and death, they find their heart crying out to the Father. They shall inherit the kingdom of God. Blessed are those who are merciful. Blessed are those who see God's eyes are full of mercy. Blessed are those who see that the law and the prophets are filled with justice, and mercy, and faith, right? They shall inherit the kingdom of God. And so then Jesus draws this distinction between the two, where the Pharisees thought the law and the prophets talked about what you need to offer God, tithes, you got to give God all these things. Right. And Jesus comes teaching what the law and the prophets actually said, right? Yeah. And he, the law and the prophets spoke about God's righteousness towards humans, not man's righteousness towards God. Right? right? Yeah. So Jesus, that's why he says, be ye perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. Right? right? If you want to trust in a righteousness, the righteousness you want to trust in is the Father's righteousness because yeah. he's perfect. He's so perfect that he doesn't return evil for evil. When you serve the Father with evil, he will return good for evil. Love covers a multitude of sins, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, here we were giving all of our sin to the Father. We came and nailed God to a cross. We emptied our sin onto him. And what did he empty of himself onto us? Did he give us evil for the evil we gave him? Nah, he gave us love, and it covered a multitude of our sins. It cleansed us from sin and death, right? right? Yeah. And that's what the point that's being drawn there. And if you keep reading in the Matthew 6, that's why it says, seek ye first the kingdom of God. And whose righteousness? Yes. Yours? Yes. His. Yes. Oh, do you see what he's teaching there? The law and the prophets, because I'm right. The law and the prophets t say the way to seek the kingdom of God is to seek God's righteousness to give it to you as a gift. The way to seek the kingdom of God is to see that God has offered his own self up for his body to be broken so that he could feed you with the bread that was unto everlasting life, right? That's what he's talking about. The way you seek the kingdom of God is by seeking God's righteousness towards you. What kind of righteousness? The kind of righteousness where when you smack the guy across the face, he gives you the other side. Didn't Jesus do that? Yeah. The kind of righteousness that if you curse a guy, he'll bless you instead of cursing him. <laughs> Didn't Jesus do that on the cross? Sure. The kind of guy that if you despitefully use him, he's going to pray for you. Didn't Jesus pray? Forgive them for they know not what they do. The kind of guy, the kind of righteousness that if you strip a guy naked, that guy isn't busy worrying about his nakedness or his own coat, but he's busy thinking about how he's going to go get you another coat to clothe upon you with. Isn't that what we see in Jesus? Yes. Right. Yes. So, that's Jesus revealing God. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Yes. Jesus is called Emmanuel, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. That's Jesus. The Word was made flesh, and God tabernacled with us, it says. Yeah. And so the whole point Jesus is teaching in the Sermon on the Mount is that when he reads the Law and the Prophets, he sees that it doesn't speak about what we're going to offer to God or what we're going to do for God. He sees that it speaks of God's righteousness towards us to to give himself up to take our death into himself rather than let us die. Yeah. That's what he sees the law and the prophets talk about. You, these scribes and Pharisees, they think the law and the prophets talk about the works which they're going to do. Well, I'm looking at the law and the prophets, and I see that the law and the prophets talk about that the Father doth work. And I'm busy seeing that the law and the prophets are prophesying of the work of God to provide himself as a lamb, to cleanse his people from sin and death. That's what I see in the law and the prophets. That's why when you get to Matthew 7, it says the people marvel at his teaching. Because he taught as one having authority. That's the rabbi. What that means was, is they never heard no teaching like this from the law and the prophets. And this guy came with a teaching that they never heard. He must have the authority to interpret the scriptures. Right. 
That's what it's talking about there. Right? Yeah. And that's why Jesus says, think not that I came to destroy the law and the prophets. I did not come to destroy the law and the prophets. I came to bring out into the open what those things were always talking about. <laughs> you guys can't see it because your dark, your understanding has been darkened by the death that's in the world. And now you're busy judging God and judging his heart for you by the death you see in yourself. You're busy judging yourself and God's heart for you as evil because you behold your own nakedness. Right? So you can't see what's there, but I'm coming to the earth to bring to fruition or bring to realization what the law and the prophets were always teaching right and what were they teaching god will provide himself a lamb god that's what he said that's what abraham said isn't it yes that's god will provide himself a lamb god can even raise the dead that's what abraham said and so jesus brought all that out in the open and you even see it in the scriptures like I quoted Psalm 40, Hebrews 10, go and read it. Yeah. It's a sacrifice and offering you had no pleasure in. Right. Now, it's not saying he had no desire for any sacrifice. The point he's making is specifically towards the sacrifices and offerings in the law. What he's saying is, listen, the sacrifices and offerings in the law, that was never what was in your heart, oh God. That was never what would make you happy. That's not the thing that could please you. You could never be pleased with those sacrifices and those offerings. It was never about what the people could offer you. It was always about you desiring to prepare a body for us that we could offer up our own body for them because we're their God. They're not our God. The people don't provide God with things. God provides the people with things. Oh, yeah. And it's so backwards, it's obscene. Yes. Yeah. It's so backwards, it's obscene. Right. And like my mom pointed out, we want so much to be accepted by God that we're busy doing all these things thinking that's how we're going to be accepted by God. But sacrifice and offering God never desired. Your works did God never need, but a body he has prepared for himself that he might do a work the likes of which no one will believe. What work? That the God of all glory did not count it robbery for him to put on our dying flesh dwell with us and absorb our sin into himself and not return our evil or our evil with evil. He didn't count it robbery to come and sit with us. He didn't count it robbery to humble himself and let himself be stripped naked. He didn't count it robbery to make himself vulnerable to us and to our sin. He didn't count it robbery to give himself up into our arms. Right? Wow. <laughs> This is the God Jesus saw. That God was born out of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, I don't do anything that I don't see the Father do. Right. Mm -hmm. And so Jesus sees sinners, everybody in the world. And you know what he sees the Father do with sinners? Yeah. Take their death into himself rather than let them die. Right. You know what he sees the Father do with sinners? Come and stand next to them and advocate for their life and defend their life against the accuser. Mm -hmm. Justify the ungodly. I see the father justifies the ungodly. Yeah. I see the father needeth nothing but has everything to give. I see the father when he thinks of people suffering at the hands of sin and death and he's rent the deepest part of his being. And there's a tender love that comes pouring out of his heart, desiring to, to alleviate people's suffering. I see the father giveth his own body to be broken, that the people who are brokenhearted and being bruised by the death in the world could find comfort from their affliction. And then you see Jesus offering his own body. Yeah. You see Psalm 40 say, sacrifice and offerings that the law talked about were never about man giving something to you, but a body you have prepared for me. Lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me. Yeah. What book? The law and the prophets. Yes. He's saying the law and the prophets were speaking about me. I'm the lamb that God would provide. I'm the lamb that would serve people with life. I'm not the lamb that needs people to serve him. I'm the lamb that washes the people's feet. I'm the lamb that cleanses the people. That's what he saw written in the law and the prophets. Right? right? right. That's why you see Jesus in, in the Gospels, in various places, doing things that people thought looked like violations of the law. Sure. But they weren't. And do you know why they weren't? Because they were completely in line with God's desire for mercy. That's why they weren't. And the law always prophesied of God's desire to visit the fatherless, visit the widows, visit, visit those that are suffering at the hands of sin and death. His desire was always to visit those people with his justice. Mm. And his justice looks like conquering their death that's bruising them and comforting them with a life that can never die again. Right. 
right? That's what his justice looks like. That's what Jesus saw. That's what he came teaching. Mm -hmm. The Pharisees, the Pharisees are complaining because people who are hungry were out picking corn. Now, what do you think they thought about the heart of God? Because like I said, in somewhere, I don't know if it was in the message or not, but we, if we don't have lunch, we feel a hunger, yeah. right? Or if we miss breakfast, we feel a hunger. Well, not so in Jesus' day. If those dudes are feeling a hunger, they ain't ate in like a week yeah. or longer, 10 days maybe. And so when they're out there picking corn, they're out there picking corn because their bodies are perishing. And so God would not look at them picking corn as a, a transgression against him. God would be filled with mercy towards them, desiring for their lives to be comforted. Sure. Right? Right. Yep. Jesus touches the woman with the issue of blood. What's well, a violation in the letter of the law? Mm-hmm. Well, why wasn't it a violation for Jesus? Why not? Because that's not what the law was actually talking about. The, woman, the lepers. Jesus touched the lepers. He didn't remove himself from the camp. Jesus performed work on the Sabbath. Why wasn't that a violation? It was to those guys in the way they read the law and the prophets. It wasn't to Jesus. Why not? These are the questions people need to start asking themselves, right? We had a great thread and great questions posted on the Bible study page. One of the things that changed my whole life is when I realized that the scriptures were all about Jesus. And then I, my prayer to God became, show me Jesus. Right. Mm-hmm. Everybody in the body of Christ that likes to read the scriptures, that likes to study the scriptures, that uh, for themselves or whether they like to minister the scriptures or whether they feel led to, to minister the scriptures, they, everyone will be well served in asking themselves, what is it that Jesus read when he read the Law and the Prophets? Not what do I read, <laughs> not what I think is written here. What is it that Jesus read when he read this? Right. And if you don't think, you know, that's a great place to start. Tell God that you desire to see what Jesus saw here. Right. Right. And then commit that desire into his hands. You have the Holy Spirit. And if you don't know that you have the Holy Spirit, you can message me and I'll lay hands on you through the phone. Right. And we'll pray for the Holy Spirit for you to be immersed in the spirit of truth. Right. You have the Holy Spirit. It's a simple prayer. Right. The door is open unto you. Jesus is the door. The problem is nobody's asking for Jesus to come and disciple them. We're busy wanting to be our own rabbi and disciple ourselves. And we're all busy exalting ourselves to be the rabbi. And no one wants to be discipled. Right. But listen. We're all in need of being discipled by the only rabbi is Jesus. And for those for those people that may listen to me and think that I'm teaching. No, I'm being taught. Everything that comes out of my mouth, I got it from looking at the word made flesh in Jesus. I got it by taking Jesus's yoke upon myself. And he said his yoke, which means doctrine in Hebrew, in the Jewish culture, when he said, take my yoke upon you for it is light and it it is easy. And it says, for I am full of meekness. What he's saying there is my doctrine makes much of the work of God and it makes nothing of man's own works. That's his doctrine. Right? right? And so I'm not teaching. I'm not rabbi. But I tell you what, I have seen who the only rabbi is. And now I've submitted all my doctrines unto the rabbi. Mm-hmm. And I weigh everything I think and everything I say up against the word made flesh in Jesus. Right. I don't just come with my own interpretation. If it doesn't match up with the, the death, the resurrection, the ascension, it's wrong. And I scrapped it. Yeah. It doesn't matter what I think is said there. I don't go with my own understanding. And like Matt pointed out, Proverbs says, lean not into your own understanding. Yet every single body, every single minister and their mother of the body of Christ is leaning unto their own understanding when they're reading the scriptures. And don't try and tell me you're not, because if you come in any with any interpretation that doesn't line up with the word made flesh in Jesus, you are leaning on your own understanding. Yeah. Right. right? Yeah. Yeah. There's one who has understanding. Right. Thomas wants to jump in. Thomas. The yeah, I was, just gonna, I was just going to say before uh, before Greg gets on a roll. <laughs> that, uh, <laughs> that, uh, another, <laughs> another, thing another thing I wanted to add. Another thing I wanted to add was, you know, when I uh, first got into uh, well, when God first got into me, 
I went to Bible studies and I was told, you know, you can spend your whole life making apple pie for God only to get to heaven and find out. Oh. That he, uh, Does he like apple pie? He likes and kind of misleading mess. Did y'all hear that? No. no. <laughs> oh, uh, we were taught uh, you can spend your whole life making <clears throat> apple pie for God only to get to heaven to find out God doesn't like apple pie. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that was kind of a, a misleading teaching in retrospect for this reason. The, the, the implication was there is something that you can do to make for God to please yeah. him. And now go find out what that is, because it mm -hmm. might not be apple pie. But it was <laughs> never. No, it was never. There's nothing God wants you to do for him other than to, to, that, to, to have him. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we thought it was so liberal. I know, I guess, you know, you're in uh, solitary confinement and you're let out in the prison yard, you think you're free, <laughs> but you're still in the prison. So it's really an incomplete or, uh, in, again, like I said, in retrospect, I'm a misleading thing. These little, these little, uh, these little uh, man-made, you know, s s summaries of what they think the truth is. And, you know, when you hear it for the first time, you know, I never heard that before. That sounds pretty good. But if you're not taught that Jesus is the word and that he's, he, 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 he's really our interpretation, the most accurate interpretation we could possibly have. If you're not told that, you're really left fumbling in the dark with, you know, half the puzzle pieces. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you have all the puzzle pieces, but you have no idea how they fit. Right. And then there's this confusion and chaos. Yeah. Right? Right. I mean... A beautiful thing that will happen is when Jesus contradicts your doctrine or what you see in Jesus contradicts what you think you read in the scriptures, mm -hmm. because contradiction is the birthing ground for revelation, mm -hmm. right? right? It's when you see it's a so contradiction true. that you realize, wait a second, I'm not understanding something here. I'm not reading this yeah. right. That's the breeding ground for God bringing forth a revelation inside of you, yeah. right? But if you think that you know, what the verses say, just by your own intellect to read it, and you're not factoring in the word made flesh in Jesus, listen, it becomes very difficult to see Jesus in the scriptures, right? And so that's how Jesus was given. It's like with the, I think we've used this example before. It's like with the, uh, what's the kind of marker that you can't see unless you have a black light? Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I know what you're talking about. I don't know what the name of it is. So. Well, light, light marker. It, it's like if you have this marker and you're right all over the wall, but you don't have the black light, or if, let's say there's right. something written all over the wall. But if you don't have a black light, you'll never see what's written there. Right. You have to have the black light to see it. Well, the scriptures are kind of like that. There's a bunch of stuff written there, but Jesus is the black light. Mm -hmm. And if you don't use Jesus to shine on those scriptures, you're never going to get out of the scriptures what's actually right. there. Great. And what you're going to have is the traditions of man that have been handed down to you from well-intentioned people, right? That never knew the Lord, that are like Job, right? That say things like, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away, <laughs> right? They only heard of God. They never knew God, right? They never saw God in the face of Jesus. In fact, they come and describe God in a way that's completely antithetical to Jesus, right? Yeah. And th that that if you don't have that, you'll end up, establishing everything you believe about God on the traditions of man, which is where the Pharisees were, yeah. which is where all of Jerusalem was when God himself came in the flesh, which is why Jesus said that the traditions of man make the word of God of none effect. We got a lot of traditions in the American church. They go back a couple hundred years. One of them is tithing, right? And the tradition about tithing in the American church is that tithing is about how you got to give money to God lest he curse you with the curse. Right. That you got to now give money to God for God to take care of you or to bless you financially. That's a tradition. Yeah. That cometh not from the word made flesh in Jesus because the word made flesh in Jesus is the meat that God provided in the storehouse for his people to eat. And so you see how perverted human beings get that don't see that the law and the prophets talked about God offering man something and think that the law and the prophets is about man offering God something. And then we establish the traditions of man as our doctrines. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that we don't give in the church. 
This whole church, I do what I do based on the generosity of people. If it wasn't for the generosity of all you people, I wouldn't be able to do what I do. Because I promise you, what I do does not allow for me to have a job. Because I'm not just working 20 hours a week. I'm not just working 30 hours a week. I'm not just working 50 hours a week. I mean, I struggle to call it work, but I'm whatever it is I'm doing, I'm doing it like 90 or 100 hours a week. And so there is no time for me to be a tent maker, right? And it's by you guys' generosity that we do what we do, right? And I didn't have to tell one of you guys that you had to give. I ain't had to call any of you up and be like, oh, look, can you think you can give? You know? Yeah. No, we just preach the spirit. Amen. Right? Amen. And it's God's message. It's God's church. Right? Yeah. And rather, let's trust God to take care of the, the ministers. Let's trust God to take care of us and let us trust God to take care of the people. Right? But we don't trust God to take care of the people. That's why we tell them they got to give money to us for God to take care of them. Right? What kind of a God needs you to give him money to take care of you? Not God. Let, we'll just use Bertie's language from yonder year, family logic. Yeah. What if there was a mama and a father that told their kids they wouldn't take care of them unless the kids gave them money? What would we think about the mother and the father? We wouldn't think well of them. No. No. What if, well, man, the kid doesn't have any money. So maybe the mother and the father comes and says, if you give us 10% of your clothes, if you cut off your sleeves, if you give us your socks, if you give us your shoes, We'll have dinner for you tonight. If you give us your bed sheet, maybe we'll let you have a bed. Now, if there was a parents doing that, what would we think of those parents? What would, we ain't even got to think about it. What do our hearts say inside of us? They're abusive. Something's wrong with them. Something's wrong on the inside, right? And then we never stop and think that we painted God Almighty in that image. Yep. And we never stop and think what that does to the hearts of people that want to trust God, but they haven't been presented with a God that's trustworthy, right? right? And we can use biblical language to even make it more fun if we want. I mean, we can have our kids be servants, right? They can be <laughs> slaves to us, yeah. right? Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. The something, first shall be last. Yes. <laughs> something powerful that you said Sunday is if you're preaching a God, that desires something from you, then you're preaching a God of your own making and he's full of lust. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Right. I don't remember saying that, but yeah. that's yeah, the truth. Did. That is the truth. Mm -hmm. And so someone might say, well, certainly there must be something for us to do. Certainly there's some role for us in this. The, the role in this is for you to let God serve you. That Peter didn't want to let Jesus wash his feet, did he? He no. fought, didn't yeah, he? Right. Mm -hmm. Right. He had to humble himself. It takes humility to let God serve you because the whole kind of a thing contradicts with pride. Right. Let it never be so, Lord, I'll wash your feet. Right. And so is it what is there for us to do? What there is for us to do is to believe on the work that God has performed to serve us with his life free from our works. That's what there is for us to do. What the one thing that Jesus said was needful was to sit at his feet. Right. And he wasn't talking about a historical Jesus. He was talking about the word that was made flesh. Sit at my feet and let me teach you and show you about the God who gave his own body up to be broken for you. Yeah. Right. Right. Allow yourself to be persuaded of the goodness in God's heart towards your life. Yeah. Right. Allow yourself to be persuaded of what he's done to conquer death. And what he's done to gift you an indestructible life. Allow yourself to be persuaded that by God's initiative and God's doing, he has drawn near to you and gifted you his indestructible life. Right. That's the thing, right? right. That's, That's it. it. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> That's it. Exactly. That's our role. That's what we need to do. That's the work. The, the, if you look in the, the Old Testament scriptures, it talks all the time about the work. That, that you receive a reward for. And you know wh what it says about that work? It says it goes down in the heart. It don't go down externally. Mm -hmm. When it, the, the New Testament talks about being blessed in your deed, it ain't talking about what you can go do outwardly. The deed that it's talking about you being blessed in is going down inside of the heart, right? And so the work that we all do is going down inside of the heart. And we either going to do the work of rejecting the lamb God provided to yeah. serve us with life, or are we going to do the work of believing on the lamb that God provided to perfect us from death? Those are the only two works. Now, if you believe on the lamb God provided, 
to serve you with life? If you believe God perfected you from sin and death by offering up his own body to be crushed, to be beaten, to be bruised, then you will be blessed in that deed. Yeah. Right. <laughs> That's it. We, again, we don't read those things. Would it, this is another great example. Jesus is rabbi. That means Jesus is the only one with the proper interpretation about the work that will cause you to be blessed in your deed. Well, there's Jesus nailed to the tree. What's the work that he did that caused him to be blessed in his deed? Believe. He believed on the Father. Yes. You know what he said? The Father will not suffer me to see corruption. Neither will he leave my life in the grave. That's the work that he did. Yeah. Do you know what he saw? He saw the Father will perfect my life from the death of this cross. The Father will cleanse my mortal body from this perishing flesh, and he will raise me up in an incorruptible flesh that's imperishable. Right. That's the deed he did. That's the work. It went down in his heart, and he was blessed in that deed, blessed in that work, because he inherited the kingdom of God inside of his physical body when he ascended to the right hand of God. Yes. Right? right. He was blessed in that deed. And yeah. Right. The reward. There's a whole lot of doctrines in the church about rewards. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, you don't get to decide. I don't get to decide. <laughs> I don't get to read those verses and decide what I think those verses mean. Jesus is the word made flesh about the rewards. Right? right? Well, what was his reward? Okay, doesn't Paul come and say we're co-heirs with Jesus? Yes. That means we inherit the same reward Jesus inherited. So what's the reward? We inherit all of God himself. Yep. That's the reward. Any other thing you want to come up with is your own private interpretation that is not revealed in the Lord Jesus. Yeah. In fact, the, the disciples, one of their mother, come to Jesus wanting one to be on the right hand and one to be on the left hand. And what did Jesus say? There's a whole parable where you have guys working all day for the Lord and one guy showing up at the end and doing nothing and got the same reward. Right. But now who cares what we see in Jesus? We have our own understanding. We're real smart. We can read the verses ourselves. We don't need rabbi. I promise you there is a breakdown of discipleship in the church. Yeah. And what I mean by that is everybody is a rabbi unto themselves. And nobody is submitting unto the rabbi, Jesus. Nobody is weighing their doctrines in light of the rabbi. It's just whatever I believe, whatever I think, whatever I've come to know. No one thought they knew more than me. I thought I knew a whole lot. And based on the world's, uh, I'll speak as a fool now, based on what the world said, I did know a whole lot. And I was, I had myself all wrapped up in my knowing. I mean, I really knew some stuff. I read some stuff. Boy, I read more than all the people in Bible college. I read all the early church fathers. I read the Talmud. I read all the scriptures frontward to backward so many times. I can't even count how many times they were. It's like today I'm swimming laps in the pool. And when you swim for like a mile and a half, you, you, you lose count of the laps. You know how many times I've read the scriptures since I'm speaking as a fool? More times front to back than I can even remember. And you know what? The Lord came to me and said, Greg, if you don't take everything you think you know and throw it in the garden, garbage and count it as done, you're never going to see me. Yeah. You're never going to see what I have to show you. Mm -hmm. And listen, I was like the rich young ruler. I went away real sad because, you know, it's like he told me, go and sell everything you think you have. Go and sell everything that you think is worth something. Yeah. Right? right. And I went away like the rich young ruler, not happy. And it took me probably a year and a half before I was like, it's all dumb. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's where the revelation began to explode because and I don't, I didn't realize it in these terms at the time, but at the time God was trying to tell me I'm rabbi, not me, him, yeah. but I was, I had gotten lifted up in my own heart as rabbi, right? My own understanding of the scriptures, my own studying of the scriptures. I had become a rabbi unto myself. I was disciple of myself. And sure, the Holy Spirit was mixed up, mixed up in there. Probably half of my doctrine still probably would hold true, but God said, throw it all away. Right? And then I saw what Paul said when he ran through that long list in Philippians, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, of the tribe of Benjamin, circumcised the eighth day, pertaining to the righteousness of the law, blameless. Right? And then he says, and I counted it all as dumb. Right? 
for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus. What he's basically saying there is, I became a disciple of the only rabbi. And I counted everything that I thought could gain me something as dumb, that I might know him in the faith that's in his heart, in the word that he saw in the scriptures, that I could be intimate with the power of the resurrection life that stood that man up out of the grave. Mm. Right? Yeah. Wow. That changes your life. Mm. It changes the way you read yeah, scripture. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> You'll start to see it. God wants nothing more than to disciple you. Yeah. Like he came to the earth so that he could show you himself. Yeah. Right? right. I mean, he put on flesh because he desires to show you. And I promise you, he gets real happy when someone wants to see him. Yeah. Right. <laughs> because just like humans, we want to be seen. Right. And we don't just want to be seen. We want to be known. Like we want somebody to look into the depth of our being and really see us and like what it is they see mm. and want to be with us, right? That's what God also desires. He wants to know and be known, right? So you come asking God, right? I remember another prayer that I prayed. I say it all the time, but for people that never heard me say this before, I used to pray to God about all the things I wanted. I used to pray to God about all the things I wanted to do, all the things I wanted to have, all the things I wanted to perform. And then when I started seeing this revelation, my prayer completely changed. And my prayer only became that I might know him and the power of his resurrection. That became my prayer. Right. You're, you're basically asking, show me Jesus. Right. Listen, God will show you Jesus. You ask God to see Jesus. He will show you. He has poured out the Holy Spirit, which is the spirit of truth, which the scripture says that when the spirit cometh, he will not speak of himself, but he will speak of me and he will guide you into all truth. Whatsoever things have been revealed in me. Mm. <laughs> right. Yes. You know, it just clicked in me that the scripture never says for us to go out and disciple people. Yeah. It says go make disciples. That's right. Big difference. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> I mean, that's why Paul would come and say, how can you say you're of Apollos? How can you say you're of Peter? How can you say you're of, of Paul? I don't think you guys are understanding. There's one rabbi, right? And one might water, another one might plant and another might water, but it's the Lord that giveth the increase. It, it's not, is it Paul that died for you? Is it Apollos that died for you? Is it Greg that died for you? Man, no, Greg did not die for you. And listen, I like you and you're beautiful. And maybe the Holy Spirit could do something in me where I could lay down my life, but my life could not save your life. Right? So Greg has not died for you, but Greg is pointing all the time to the one who did die for you. And Greg is pointing all the time to the one rabbi that there is. And so like Paul would say, follow me as I follow God. Mm -hmm. Right? Walk with me as I walk with God, knowing he's the only rabbi. Yeah. Right? Because you got a whole lot of people that are going to come and say they're the Christ. Yeah. You got a whole lot of people coming. Would you say that out loud what you said? I can't repeat it. About many shall come to you saying that they're the Christ. Well, no, he said, many shall come in my name saying that I am the Christ. Yeah, so say what you said about that. He's not saying many will come saying I am I am the Christ myself. He said, many will come. Who's doing the speaking? Jesus is speaking. Right. So he said, many will come in that day saying that I am the Christ, saying that Jesus is the Christ, but all the times trying to heap disciples unto themselves. Yes. You see? Ah, and Jesus yes. would go say, you search land and sea to make one disciple and, and make one proselyte. And when you find him, you make him twofold more the child of hell than yourself. <laughs> yeah. exactly. And I used to wonder how that thing really went down. Uh, and I finally saw it illustrated in the life of Paul himself or Saul of Tarsus, because we find in in the book of Acts that hit the guy, because Paul said, he said, I was a disciple of Gamaliel. Right. Well, Gamaliel shows up in the book of Acts. And in the book of Acts, he said, you know, how can we go against this thing if it's God's doings? And if it's not God's doings, it's going to, it's going to dissipate on its own. Yeah. So when I'm reading that, I'm thinking, wait a minute, this guy sounds reasonable. <laughs> okay. So if, if he was the guy that Paul was looking to, to disciple him or Saul of Tarsus, how did he wind up so far out to the place where he was out killing Christians? And Jesus brought that verse to my attention. He made him twofold more the child of hell. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. wow. 
whoever you listen to, you want them always to be pointing to the work of God in Christ. Yeah. Right? right? God's the one that produces life. He's the one that produces the fruit of the spirit. Whatever good thing can be born in anyone's life is going to come by the hand of God or it isn't going to come at all or it's manufactured fruit, yeah. which is not fruit at all. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that's who you want to listen to and walk with and talk with. And that doesn't mean they're rabbi. It means you see they know who the rabbi is. Right. Mm -hmm. right? And then what can happen is you can develop a group of people who talk with each other knowing there's one rabbi. So if they come with a dispute about a doctrine or something, they're not arguing with each other's intellects, which is what I find happening all of the time. Yeah. Like nobody wants to reason from the word made flesh. They want to reason from their own intellect. Mm -hmm. But when you get in a body that understand there's one rabbi, what happens if there's differing thoughts about a doctrine is you don't talk about what each of you think. You talk about what each of these things look like in light of the word made flesh in Jesus. Right. 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 And that's how people don't get into prideful arguments and fights. That's how you don't end up with divisions in the church where one guy disagrees with the other guy's doctrine. So they split the church in half and take half of them away with them. Right. right? Yeah. You get that when you have leaders in the church that are filled with lust and they're filled with pride. Yeah. Right? right. And I say that from the spiritual mind. Right. I'm not condemning them. I'm talking about how a person's heart can be filled with lack. And if their lack is conceived in their heart, they're busy doing ministry and doing church from the perspective of them trying to gather life to themselves. Right. right? And it's not a pleasant thing when you get that going down. Some of you guys have been in a church where you saw something like that happen mm -hmm. and people start cannibalizing each other. Mm -hmm. That's what happens when you don't see there's one rabbi, because now it's not like, well, I think this and he thinks that. Both of you are like, well, what's seen in the word made flesh? Yeah. And then you're that's iron sharpening iron. You can have iron sharpening iron if both people are not reasoning from the place of the word made flesh. Right. right. You have each person trying to establish their own doctrine as the correct doctrine. Right. Yes. That's how iron sharpening iron happens. Both people come together and they realize there's one rabbi. What is what what I'm saying? What does it look like in light of the word made flesh? What you're saying? What does it look like in light of the word made flesh? Let's take all of our thoughts captive to the obedience of Christ. Yes. And that's actually what it's talking about. And it's not you going to perform some war to take every thought captive. It's that when you see there's one rabbi. When you see the word made flesh is the only word about the law and the prophets, it will take your thoughts captive. Yep. It will discern your heart and it will remove the thoughts that cometh not from above. It will circumcise your heart like a sharp two edged sword. It will divide the carnal mind from the mind of Christ and it will remove it. And that's how it will do when you have a doctrinal disagreement amongst brothers yeah. and sisters. Right. Right. Yeah. That's how it works. Does that make sense? Yeah. There's one rabbi. Right. It's so powerful. And the, the thought of, of discussing something and having the common ground of the word made flesh to discuss from allows you to have an intelligent conversation about that and, and keeps you from, I don't know, keeps you from, I'm better than you because I did this and this and this, and I know this. It all comes to the common denominator of the word made flesh. What, what a great way to have unity in the spirit. Yeah, because what happens is, is you come together, like Jesus said to the rich young ruler, because the rich young ruler came to Jesus and called him good master. Yeah. Well, the reason why he called him good master is because he saw all the things he was doing outwardly. Right. Well, Jesus <laughs> knowing what was in his heart and loving him, Jesus realized this guy thinks I am the good one. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, I, he sees me as the son of man. He's not coming to me as if I'm God in the flesh right now. He's coming to me as if I, the son of man, am good by my own strength. Right. And so then Jesus says there's one who's good. Right. And so when you have people come together to reason, knowing there's one who's good, meaning there's one who is the truth. So this isn't about one of us is right and one of us is wrong. There's only one who's ever been right. 
There's only one who is understanding. There's only one who is the truth. It's Jesus, right? right? And now we come together knowing that we're not the truth. Right. This isn't about who's right and who's wrong. It's just about let us all submit our doctrines to God's doctrine right. because Jesus is God's doctrine, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Now all of a sudden we understand what it is to have the mind of Christ. Because I know when I was coming up in charismania, the mind of Christ was this ethereal, mystic mm. something, you know, where if I find myself in a situation like, okay, I don't know if I'm supposed to take this job or not, but I've got the mind of Christ. And, I, and, and it sounded good. And I kept wishing the thing would start thinking for me, but it never happened. Right. Because... <laughs> But what he's saying is when it comes when it comes to the law and the prophets, we have the mind of Christ because it's demonstrated in the death, burial, and resurrection. It's not some little thing in your head that's gonna start going to... yeah. Oh man, this, the crazy stuff we believed. We have the mind of Christ. Well, one of the things you could say about the mind of Christ is that Jesus said the hour is coming where the prince of this world is going to come to me and everyone will scatter from me. Right. He's talking about being at the cross yeah. and it'll look like I'm all alone, but I won't be alone because the father will be with me. Mm -hmm. John 16, I think right around verse 30, go and read it. That's the mind of Christ. Mm -hmm. The mind of Christ knew God is with me. Yeah. Even should I make my bed in hell, even should my bed be made in sin and death, you are with me, O Lord. The psalmist said that. Right. David said that. That's right. Speaking by inspiration of the spirit of the son, the mind of Christ, Christ. Right. And so Jesus had the mind of Christ. He had the spiritual mind. He knew that death and darkness was not a sign that God wasn't there. He knew that it wasn't a sign God was far from him. He knew it wasn't a sign God had abandoned him, that God had turned his back on him. He knew it wasn't a sign of that. He knew that the Father did not abhor people when they were afflicted with sin and death. He knew that the Father did not hide his face from people. He knew that the Father hears people when they cry out to him. He had the mind of Christ. Right. One of the worst things that happened during this whole COVID thing, it, man, it really it really upsets me because the church over and over again. And I say this because I love the church. But Peter said judgment must first come to the house of the Lord. And he didn't mean condemnation. What he meant was that the truth about God needs to be revealed in the house of the Lord first. Right. One of the things that hurt me so bad in COVID was the perfect time for the church to come and declare the goodness of God. But they didn't do that. They came and blasphemed the name of the Lord in the midst of the congregation. And do you know what they said in the midst of the congregation? They said that this COVID, all this plague that's come upon us is because of our sin. God has abandoned us and judged us because of our sin. This COVID is the evidence of that. The leaders of the body of Christ did that. They went to the Capitol and they did that. They blasphemed the name of God is what they were doing. Jesus says in Psalm, I think it's Psalm 40 still, a preacher of righteousness, right. it says. Yeah. It talks about a preacher of righteousness. And it doesn't talk about a guy standing in the midst of the great congregation and declaring that God has abandoned you because of your sin. Do you know what a preacher of righteousness is? A guy who stands in the midst of the great congregation and says, God, pick me up out of my sin and my death. You declare the righteousness of God. You have the mind of Christ. You declare to the people, God is here with us. You declare to the people that this COVID is not a sign. God's not here. This COVID is not a sign that if we'll repent from our sin, God will heal the land. This COVID is not a sign God has forsaken us. And then they would go into God has heard our cries. He grieves at our suffering and he's conquered death in the body of Jesus' resurrection. And you would bring comfort to people that were being tormented by the plague. And you would start talking about the Lamb of God and how it removed the death that was reigning over the world. And you would begin declaring a God who preserves from death and a God who rather die himself than let people die at the hands of sin. And you would declare that in the midst of the great congregation. And do you know what you would find? People coming home. Yeah. Yeah. Like the prodigal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was a perfect opportunity for this nation and for the world to find themselves crying out to the, the Lord. But no, that didn't happen because we got many rabbis. We got many people that exalt their own knowledge. And in professing themselves to be wise, they've revealed how foolish they are, right? Yeah. 
come and tell people suffering at the hands of death that it's because of God? It's by the hand of God? Yeah. You're the devil, man. That's the devil coming out of your mouth. That's what the scripture talks about when it talks about corrupt communication. And it says, let no corrupt communication come out of your mouth. It's not talking about cuss words. Now, that doesn't mean go around and cuss around everybody. I become all things to all people that I might win the more. When I'm off in the streets with all the people that are in the streets, I talk like the people in the streets. But when I'm in a person's house that don't like cuss words, I'm not in there cussing. But corrupt communication is when the thing that comes out of your mouth is like a two-edged sword, not like the sword of the spirit, but like the tongue of a snake. Right. Double-minded. Right? It profanes God. You're profaning the name of God. Yes. How do you profane the name of God? You say that the sin and death that's manifesting is at the hands of God. It's the thief that steals, kills, and destroys, not God. Guess what? Jesus said that. Yeah. The word made flesh. <laughs> right? <laughs> Jesus Amen. healed the blind guy. The reason he healed the blind guy is because the world was blind. They thought God was the one that was stealing and killing and destroying sinners. Yeah. Jesus showed up and he justified the ungodly. Yeah. He showed up and justified the woman caught in the act of adultery. He did not serve that woman with death. Now, did he? Do you know why he didn't serve the woman with death? Because he saw in the law and the prophets that God's not the one serving sinners with death. It's the thief serving sinners with death. God's the good Samaritan. And when God finds someone that's beaten and bloodied and left for dead on the side of the road, he comes and he picks them up and fills them with the wine of his life. Mm -hmm. That's what Jesus saw. That's what Jesus was doing in the, the midst of the temple with the woman caught in the act of adultery. And this is what all the leaders in the body of Christ should have been doing in the middle of COVID. Right. We should have been declaring that God is not far from us, that he hears our cries, that he's grieved at the suffering that's come into the world, that he has not left us alone here. He has not abandoned us, but he has conquered death inside of the body of Jesus's resurrection. He has come in the flesh himself and become a lightning rod to the sin and the death that's tormenting us right now. And he has absorbed that sin and death into his own body. His own body was crushed and beaten and bruised so that he could conquer death inside of his body come out of the grave in a flesh that can never die again and now feed you the bread of life mercy right mercy yeah mercy. exactly mercy mm -hmm. have mercy <laughs> right that's what they should have been declaring in the midst of the great congregation that god has gotten it right to liberate your life from being held in the world your life is no longer held in the world but god has done something to where your life could be hid with him in the body of jesus right this is you would have Dude, you would have found people feeling loved by God. Right. But now what happened, we come and preach a message telling people if they'll clean up their behavior, then God will love them again. Right. Listen, man, I don't think people understand what it means to be the branch. Because if you're a branch, you can't clean up your behavior. All you can do is be told that there's a vine that's full of life. And that vine has done something so you could be grafted into it free from your own effort. And then you could start to see the vine that's throbbing with life. And you could start to see your life grafted into that vine. And you could start to see yourself as a branch that's pulsating with life. And you start bearing much fruit. Right? Yes. God doesn't come and tell a branch to produce fruit and then he'll heal the lamb. <laughs> I and mean, if we, we thought about these things, we think how insane they were. Imagine I come here today with a branch and throw it on the ground and start commanding it to produce fruit. You guys would think I lost the plot. Yeah. But that's what we heard in the body of Christ for how long now? And we just go along with it like it's right. That's true. And for like 30 some years, we went along with it like it was right. Binding and loosen, man. Jesus, Jesus said that uh, he asked Peter, he said, he says, who do you say that I, the son of man, am? Right. Notice he throws that in there. He makes a point to identify with human. Mm -hmm. He makes a point to identify himself with mankind. Mm -hmm. Who do you say that I, the son of man, am? Right? Mm -hmm. Who do people say? That? Well, some people say this. Some people say that. And Peter, you know, he's the loud one. He's like me. <laughs> right? Oh, man, I've gone through a lot of hell before I realized how wrong I was. Kind of like Peter. Um, <laughs> Oh, uh, but then Peter jumps in and says, you are the Christ. You're the son of the living God. Jesus says the gates of hell, which in that context, that word hell means Hades, Hades, which means the place of the dead, the grave. 
is what it means. The purposes of the devil, the work of the devil to sting you with his death. Mm -hmm. Jesus said against this revelation that the son of man is the son of God, the gates of hell cannot stand right? The revelation that I'm the son of God inside of human flesh, the gates of death cannot stand against that revelation. He says, and I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. I will give you keys to the kingdom of heaven. What he's saying there is, is I'm going to take back the keys of Hades because I'm the son of man and I'm going to be lifted up and I'm going to draw every bit of the serpents at poison into my own body. And I'm going to let my body absorb the bite of the serpent. And I'm going to be lifted up from that death because it's not possible for death to hold me because I am the resurrection and the life. And when death tries to hold me, I'm going to kick open the gates of AIDS. I'm going to take back the keys from the grave. I'm going to give you the sure mercies of David, which are the keys to heaven. I'm going to give you free access to the life of God. And whatsoever you bind on earth and whatsoever you loose on earth shall be bound and shall be loosened. And the loosing that you do is you walk around as a witness of the resurrection and you begin declaring a life that overcomes death in the flesh. And you start loosing people from the grave clothes. You start calling people out of the grave, just like Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. Because you start declaring the word of a life that's overcome the grave. And that the grave isn't locked anymore. That Jesus open the door and the door that he opened no man can shut no devil can shut ever again and you start binding the strong man in people's lives you leave the strong man's house desolate unto him by purifying people's hearts from fear because you come and tell them about how death has been overcome and now death becomes abolished in their heart and when death is abolished in their heart their hearts been purified from fear and their grave clothes come off and they come out of the grave like lazarus right yes that's what Jesus is talking about. That's what people should have been saying in the Capitol when COVID went down. Right. That's what, so, that's what somebody in the church needs to stand up and say. Mm-hmm. Right? Even today. Oh, even today. Nonstop. Yeah. Yeah. Nonstop. Amen. Amen. Nonstop. Wow. 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 So um, I have something in mind that was kind of funny that happened the day after you were talking about tithing, um, I had a friend come. I'm on Tyler's phone. <laughs> so that's why you see Tyler's face. Okay. Um, <laughs> but my friend, she came to me and she was telling me how God told her, you know, uh, to tithe because she, she was going through some financial stuff and she had in her heart to tithe and to trust, to trust him, you know. And then the next day she did end up getting blessed with, some furniture that she was needing and I can see how easy it is to get persuaded of that you know of that uh tithing um to the church but I was talking to Sade about this and kind of you know that that reminder that we are made of the image of God and that we can manifest you know but it's just giving that glory back to God and that's who who it's coming from like without our need to do something Yeah, I mean, the scripture says it rains on the just and the unjust. So just because it rains, I don't know why we suppose it's because of our good works. The whole point is is God causes it to rain on on the just and the unjust. And it's it's by the love in his heart, not not by what we did. You can even go and read, since we talked about the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus goes in to consider the lilies of the field. They need their toil. Uh, and yet God clothes upon them. He talks about the sparrows and the earth who neither sow nor reap. Right. And yet your heavenly father careth for them. And he yes. says of how much more value are you than the lilies or the sparrows? The sparrows don't sow and reap. And yet we're going to sow and reap in order for God to take care of us. Man, God came to take care of us when he sowed Jesus into the earth. This parable of the sower sowing the seed. You want to talk about sowing and reaping? You have to talk about it in the terms of God himself sowed the seed. That's Jesus. That's his life. It's his incorruptible life. That's God pouring out on everybody a blessing. Right? Right. Right. Yeah, but you're right. Um, You're right. People... When people look in the the earth for signs and they try to live by signs other than the sign of the resurrection and Jonah being spit out of the whale of the belly, 
when they live by signs, yeah, you you can find things happening all the time. I can also point you to a, a person that hates God. They got blessed yesterday, right? <laughs> I mean, it's not because I mean it's not because they they gave a talk, right? Right, right. right. <laughs> yeah, I have to just yeah. remember. Yeah, um, I just thought that was I thought that was very interesting how that happened right after you know I was hearing the true tithe, you know. Absolutely. So, Right. Yeah. I'm also that, very excited for that. Uh, I'm excited for that book from Birdie, Greg. I appreciate you on that. Yeah. Listen, it, it's going to be a couple days behind because I didn't realize it, but Monday was a holiday. So I, I wasn't able to send it on Monday. <laughs> um, my wife went to go mail it. No worries. She was like halfway and she realized that she couldn't <laughs> mail it today. Day. It was Memorial Day. <laughs> but yeah, it, it, it's on the way. Yeah. <laughs> I think you'll enjoy it. And there's a lot of other great stuff in that book. Yeah, you bet. It's not just about that. I mean, it ties in. When you start to see what the tithe is really about, it's really the revelation of God and God's heart to care for his people, right? And it, it'll change everything. Yeah. At least know? half the book is about tithing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's right. All right. Anybody else have any comments or thoughts they'd like to share? This is a good one. <laughs> this has been spectacular. Mm -hmm. Start to finish, the whole thing. It's been mm -hmm. amazing. Absolutely amazing. All righty. Well, we'll call it, we'll call it an evening then. Thanks everybody for joining us. Bye. Glory to God. You guys. Bye. Thanks everyone Bye. for sharing. Have a good night. Have a good night. Have a good night.